All right. Good morning, everybody. It's uh, Think Green Thursday. And today we're going to talk composting strategies with Taylor Jones, our 4-H agent at Extension. And he's uh, almost a doctor <laughs> of composting. <laughs> no, he's, a, he's working on his PhD. So we're welcome. Welcome, Taylor. And uh, tell us all about composting. Yeah, good morning, everybody. So as Chris said, I'm Taylor. I'm a 4-H agent in Alamance County. And today we're going to talk about composting, but we're also going to talk about vermicomposting. So if you've never heard that term before, you'll be interested to find out more about that later on this morning. Um, so to get us started today, I wanted to do a little activity. It's called Chat Waterfall. And so what's going to happen is I want you to go ahead and try to find the chat feature in your Zoom and pull that up. And what I want you to do is I want you to type in a ingredient to compost, but don't send it yet. Don't hit enter yet. Just type it into the chat and then I'm gonna count us down and everybody's gonna hit enter at the same time. And we're gonna have a waterfall of compost ingredients. So I'm gonna give you a couple minutes to, to find your chat feature. Should be at the bottom of your screen. You're gonna click on it, type in an ingredient to compost. And then I'm gonna count us down and we're all gonna send it all at one time so we can see what everybody is thinking. I want, I want to get you thinking this morning. Give you just a few more seconds to do that. And then I'm gonna count us down. All right, when I say one, I want you to hit enter so we can see what everybody's thinking for your compost ingredient. Three, two, one. Oh yeah, banana peel, food scraps, vegetable scraps, bacteria, dried fallen leaves, table scraps, yes, 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 yes. Okay, wonderful. So yep, that was awesome, let me, Share my screen here. Let's see. All right, so you all should be able to see my screen. Give me a thumbs up if you can see the screen. All right, good, cool, thank you. So. Good morning. We are going to talk about compost today. Um, this slide set is uh, was prepared by Rhonda Sherman um, and Mark Danieli, a former court agent here in Alamance County. And Rhonda Sherman is our composting and vermicomposting guru at NC State University. You're going to meet her in a couple of videos today, but I just wanted to give them credit for putting together this presentation. So we're gonna start off with what's compost? So we, we've heard this term before, compost, composting. Well, what exactly is it? Well, the definition, textbook definition is uh, composting converts organic materials, leaves, kitchen scraps, garden waste into a valuable product, which when used on gardens, lawns, and houseplants results in a healthier plant growth when added to the soil. So basically it is that sort of natural uh, fertilizer, that natural uh, soil uh, conditioner that you can add to your plants to make them a little more healthy. Um, so this is our end product. So we're going to sort of start at the end and then work our way back. But this is what your goal compost should look like. It should be nice and dark brown or sometimes even black. It should be a little crumbly, sort of like uh, if you purchase like potting soil um, from, from a store, sort of that material, that consistency, um, nice and crumbly, uh, crumbly. It should be humus rich, not hummus, but humus. Um, and it should smell like soil. It should smell like, you know, a nice earthy um, smell and not, not sort of a, a foul smelling sort of thing. So just some really quick benefits of compost, as I'm sure most of you know, compost is an excellent, excellent thing. Otherwise, we really wouldn't be talking about it, right? So it improves soil structure, texture, aeration. Um, it increases the water holding capacity um, and uh, it helps prevent erosion and it 
definitely boosts soil fertility and it definitely suppresses diseases um, both in the in the soil and for your plants and then it also helps in root development of your plants especially when you have seedlings or you're starting some germination of some seeds uh, for your garden. So basically the answer to this question what plants benefit from compost is all plants, right? So from our seedlings that we're starting indoors or that we might have already started this year, all the way up to trees and forests. Compost is definitely a, a benefit to all plant life, all uh, plants that we you know see every day. So what, what do we do first? So we're gonna determine our needs um, based on number one, the amount of organic materials that you regularly, regularly have available. So are you someone who has a lot of, you know, table scraps, a lot of, or I should say, uh, food scraps that uh, are, are, you know, vegetable and fruit, um, you know, basis. Um, what kind of space do you have? So number two is what kind of space do you have for composting? Do you have a little back patio or, or you know, sort of a window escape sort of area? Or do you have a large, uh, expansive acreage on your property that you know, that you can use for, for composting. And then what degree of effort do you want to put into this process? So we're gonna talk about a few different ways to compost. One being, um, I would say one of the most popular and that sort of set it and forget it sort of style of composting. But then we also have some ways that we can really speed up that process and get some compost going pretty quickly. <coughs> So you wanna think about where you're gonna put your pile or your compost bin, depending on what sort of style that you're gonna do. It needs to be nice and flat and open, um, easily accessible, because if you can't get to it, it's gonna be hard to really work it. And it's you know sort of not gonna do what you want it to do. And it, it may even cause other problems in your yard. Um, you wanna make sure that areas in front and above it are clear. Um, this is for aeration, so our compost pile needs air to in order for the uh, decomposition to work. So you wanna make sure that it's, it's open above and, and, and in front of. Uh, a shady area is, uh, is preferable. Um, that's because it won't dry out as quickly. So we'll learn that your compost needs to also have lots of moisture in it for all of that um, you know, decomposition and stuff to happen. So if it's in a shady area, it won't dry out as quickly. And then it also needs to be adjacent to where you're going to use it, right? So, you know, if you've got a vegetable garden in your backyard, it would be a great spot to put your compost pile right near that area. So you can just take that finished compost product and distribute it on to your garden area. So there's basically two types of ways that you can compost. So the, the first way is, is what we call a single batch. So basically, you sort of stockpile all these materials, all these things that we're gonna talk about that you can add to a compost bin and you're gonna add them all at one time. Um, you are gonna layer them and, and there's a little bit of a recipe that goes with that. But this is basically your single batch. You're gonna sort of put it all together at one time and then you're gonna work it or you're gonna let it you know, sit and do its thing. But then there's also a second way that you can do this and that's a continuous pile. So a lot of times, folks will have sort of um, either a continuous pile or they can also have sort of a sectioned off pile. So we're gonna talk about the three section method here in a little bit, um, but that's how you can sort of continuously compost as you get materials, as you get you know um, uh, nitrogen and carbon sources and all that kind of stuff, but we'll talk about that a little later. So equipment, uh, basic gardening equipment that you'll need um, to compost. And this is mainly for those of you who want to compost and sort of do it actively rather than, than you know, passively. And that's, you know, working your soil and that sort of thing. Um, but you wanna make sure you have a pitch fork. This is gonna help with uh, turning your compost pile and incorporating air and other materials into your compost pile. Um, you know, it sort of just helps with that aeration. Uh, you also need a watering can or hose or access to water, you know, depending on where your compost bin is, because like I said, we're going to need moisture in our compost in order for it to do what it needs to do. Um, containers or buckets, depending on if you're in a bin or if you're doing it in a pile or whatever the case may be, you're going to need those sort of things to, to get uh, materials to your compost bin or, or pile and then you're going to have to move that compost to wherever you need to use it. Um, a strainer is typically a good idea. We'll also talk about the uses of a strainer and what a strainer is used for 
Um, and then a, a, a shovel, of course, and a wheelbarrow for obvious reasons. So this is sort of the makeup or the ingredients of our compost. So you all put some excellent compost ingredients into our waterfall or chat earlier, but this is what our compost is made of. So it's made up of our browns and greens, which I'll talk, we'll talk about here in a little bit about what exactly that means and what's what and which ones are which. Um, it's also going to have microorganism, microorganisms inside of your compost. So this is going to happen naturally. Um, there are ways that we can sort of, uh, you know, speed up that process, but they're going to naturally get into your compost bin and they're, they're absolutely needed in order for the decomposition to happen. You're also going to have earthworms and insects. So there's going to be lots of things that you can see, um, you know, with your eye, like the earthworms and the insects, but there's also lots of microorganisms like we talked about. Um, you're gonna need organic materials. So you're gonna need, you know, plant-based materials in order for your compost to make compost. Um, and then we're also gonna need moisture and air. So just really quick, the only thing I want you to take away from this slide is there's two basic uh, phenomenon happening inside your compost uh, pile. So you've got chemical breakdown and you've got uh, physical breakdown. So there's microorganisms that we talked about are chemically breaking down all of those pieces and ingredients in your compost pile while your soil invertebrates and, and other creatures and, and um, organisms are physically breaking down your pile. So they are physically making bigger particles into smaller particles in order for those microorganisms to take over. And this is just some examples of our microorganisms, bacteria, fungi mostly, um, and, and bacteria are gonna make up a big portion of what's in, of the microorganisms inside of your compost bin. Um, and they're responsible for most, or if not all of the chemical decomposition inside of your compost pile. Um, you also have actinomycetes. I don't know how you say that word. Chris and Mike can, uh, uh, Correct me, but um, they are fungi-like bacteria um, and they break down tough plant materials, sort of like stems and things and sticks that are a little harder for, uh, for some other organisms to break down. And then you also have fungi and uh, mushrooms and things like that that decompose tough plants and plant parts as well. So just really quick, the only thing I want you to take away from this slide is there are three phases of that chemical decomposition, mesophilic, thermophilic, and mesophilic. Um, again, basically they are going through phases, those microorganisms are breaking down that plant material, that uh, organic material into making it into usable compost for your plants. Again, our soil invertebrates. So these are the little things that we're seeing inside of our compost bin. They are helpful. Um, so they're responsible for the physical decomposition in your pile. They are um, during the heating phase. So your, your compost pile is going to heat up, um, and that's, again, sort of where some of the decomposition is going to happen. But during that heating phase, your soil invertebrates are going to go, are going to go dormant, or they might die off, um, or move to the outer parts of your compost pile where it's a little cooler. Um, you know, everything from worms, sow bugs, springtail, centipedes, you know, mites, beetles, millipedes, all those insects and things that typically we can see um, are our soil invertebrates. Um, so the browns versus greens, what do we compost? So our browns are what we call our carbon um, sources for our compost. And then our greens are our nitrogen sources for our compost. So those browns are sugar rich, um, energy providing to our microorganisms to break down the organic matter. Um, so these are like dried leaves, newspapers, straw, sawdust, um, uh, cardboard, you know, those sorts of uh, paper products sort of things um, and, and leaves and things are, are brown sources. And then our greens are providing the protein to our microorganisms through nitrogen. So these are a lot of our, what we call sort of, um, you know, fresh, fresh ingredients. So grass clippings and food scraps. Um, a lot of these things are, not, are green when you add them to your compost pile. That's why we call them their greens. So this is a list of some other ingredients that we can add to our compost. This is not a uh, all-inclusive list. There are some other things that you can compost. There's also some other things that you cannot compost. And we'll talk about that in a little while. But basically, 
um, you know, anything that has a plant source or plant base, um, you know, in, in production. So lots of uh, uh, paper materials, obviously plant materials are gonna do great, um, but maybe some things that you didn't think about such as pencil shavings or, you know, those little skewers that you use um, when you're doing barbecues or something like that, toothpicks even. Um, you can use, uh, you know, old organic uh, loofahs that you don't do well in the shower anymore. Um, one thing about leaves and things that I want to mention here is you want to make sure that you are not adding plant materials that have diseases or pests inside of your uh, compost because those things can, can actually get worse and multiply in your compost. And then once you go to distribute your compost, it can spread those things to other plants. So you want to make sure that the materials that you're putting that are directly from plants aren't, uh, you know, covered in disease or, or uh, insects or pests or anything like that. Um, wine corks you can also uh, put in here. You can put cotton balls, um, you know, just a ton of different things that you can use inside of your compost bin or your compost pile, depending on, you know, what you have in your yard. Um, this is more important though. These are the things that you should not um, add into your compost. So anything that is really sort of animal based, right? So, so no meat, um, generally no bones, but we'll you can add bone meal, which is a different com uh, conversation, um, but, but no fish, no you know, dairy or, or eggs or anything like that. Um, also, do not add pet waste into your compost pile because of what our pets eat. It is not sort of a plant-based thing, so you don't want that inside of your compost bin. Um, and of course, you don't want anything that's been treated with any sort of chemicals or anything like that. Um, also, typically we don't, um, you know, want to add any sort of lumber products, even if treated or not, um, just because mainly they're really, really large and they'll take forever to break down. Um, and then, like I said, the diseased plants and leaves, you want to make sure you keep out. And then you want to make sure that you're not composting any weeds, um, you know, because they can, again, multiply and, and be spread into wherever you put your finished products. So an, another few things, um, again, like I said, weeds, you don't want to put any weeds inside, especially if they've already gone to seed because those seeds will um, germinate inside of your compost bin or they'll wait till you're, you distribute the compost and, and then they'll germinate, which will be you know, a big problem. Um, no ash or coal, um, these can be harmful to pets. Um, no wood ash, um, it's too alkaline, so it'll throw off everything and, you know, harm the microorganisms and all that that's doing the uh, decomposition. Um, and then nothing, you know, no lime or anything like that. It releases gases and you just won't, don't want that into your, uh, in, in your compost pile. So here are a few um, what we call wire mesh compost bins. Um, so these are pretty easy. We've got one behind the office here. Um, at work and uh, these, these are pretty easy. These are sort of what I call set it and forget it piles. Um, you know, you sort of add in all your materials all at once. You make sure you layer it up right and then you sort of set it and let it do its thing and then you're ready to use it later on. Um, so now we're gonna talk a little bit about the balance between browns and greens. So it's not gonna be a one-on-one -one balance. So you're gonna to wanna to make sure you have more carbon sources than more nitrogen. Um, so generally the, the ratio that you're looking for is a 30 to one um, or 20 to 30 parts carbon to one part nitrogen. Um, and basically what that breaks down to is, is chemically, but not, not volume. Um, so you don't need 30 times more carbon or browns than you do nitrogens or greens. Um, so here's just a few of the ratios of different sources. So you can see some things are really high in carbon, um, you know, like your, your cardboards and your bark, your bigger pieces, and then of course your nitrogen there on the side. Um, one thing I want to draw your attention to is the uh, waste products of livestock. Um, so as you can see, there's lots of high um, nitrogen uh, ratios here with the, with the livestock waste. Um, just be careful when you're adding that sort of thing. You, you, you don't want to sort of overgreen your compost pile because then things can start to go south really quick and start to smell and, and we don't want all that kind of stuff. Um, so basically this is how you determine your, um, your ratio. So you're going to add materials in equal amounts 
um, but you're going to sort of layer it and do the conversion there um, at the bottom. And Chris, I don't know if we can send out this uh, presentation to folks or not so they can revert, refer back to these numbers, but, but we can try to, try to do that. Um, but basically you just wanna make sure that you sort of have that uh, ratio sort of 30 to one um, carbon to, to nitrogen. I will uh, send, um, if they, I, this will be up on YouTube in the next few days. Um, yeah. But if anybody wants the, the slides themselves, uh, I think we can probably do a PDF. I'm not sure, just they can email, email me and we'll, we'll discuss. Perfect, yeah, we can work on that. Excellent, okay. So back to our sort of browns for our, uh, our ratios and stuff. So your maple leaves are going to be great sources um, for your carbon. They are um, fairly high in carbon um, and with the right moisture and with the right uh, aeration and air, they can break down um, really quickly. Um, whereas our oak leaves are a little bit different. Uh, they actually produce high levels of tannins which are resistant to decay. So they sort of have an extra layer of protection when it comes to decay. So they can take a little bit longer um, to, to decompose in your pile. Um, but just sort of depending on what your yard looks like, what kind of leaves you have that, you know, fall in the fall and things like that, just sort of keep that in mind that there is a difference between maple leaves and oak leaves. Um, and if you don't know which is which, give our office a call and we can figure out and sort of help you determine that. Um, so a little bit about surface area. Um, so it is important and it, and it sort of helps with the decomposition um, processes inside of your, your pile. Um, so obviously larger pieces of, of ingredients into your compost are gonna take longer to, do, to break down than smaller pieces. So what I like to tell people is, is try to add your, your ingredients to your compost as small of a particle as possible. So you know, if you have like leftover banana peels or, or citrus peels or something, go ahead and chop them up if you can and break them, you know, make them into even smaller pieces because it'll really, uh, really increase uh, the, the speed of how they get decomposed in your pile. Um, how much moisture does your pile need? So you do need moisture inside of your pile in order for all the things to work. Um, so basically, if there's too much or too little moisture, it's going to significantly um, slow down the process of decomposition. Uh, but you're looking for sort of a 40 to 60% moisture level inside of, your, inside of your pile. So Taylor, what does that mean? Basically you want your pile, if you get a handful of your pile, you want it to feel like sort of a wrung out sponge, sort of that consistency. Um, but again, if, if, if there's too much moisture inside of your compost, bin it or your pile um, it can it can uh, start to sort of go stale um, and, and and sort of stink so if for some reason um, you know your compost pile does get a little too much of your uh, of moisture you can always add in those browns so those dry leaves paper sawdust all that kind of stuff and so air is sort of similar as uh, moisture because it, it helps the decomposition process but it also helps with ventilation and it also makes sure that, you know, there's little to no odor because it's sort of moving those things, moving air through your compost pile. Um, you can incorporate air with your uh, sort of turning it every, you know, couple weeks or so. Uh, but if you're not, if, if, if you're gonna do the sort of set it and forget it sort of style of compost, you wanna make sure that it, whatever it's in um, has plenty of, of natural ventilation. Um, and then, uh, of course, if it, if it becomes an anaerobic process, which means no air, then your uh, compost pile is going to start smelling bad. Um, it's going to take forever to actually decompose, um, and it's just not going to be a pleasant, pleasant experience for you. Um, so, uh, so how hot is your compost going to get? So it is going to reach temperatures um, in the middle, upwards of 100 degrees, a little, maybe a little higher, hotter than that. Um, but what's happening when that happens is it's killing, you know, weed seeds and disease organisms and, and all that kind of stuff. But you want to make sure that it doesn't get too hot. Um, and, and this is where your moisture is going to come in um, because it can also um, kill your uh, decomposers and, and your microorganisms and your uh, soil invertebrates as well. Um, so this is sort of a natural process. And again, 
if, if it's too hot, you can always add moisture. Typically that's gonna be the problem and how it gets too hot. Um, how long does it take for your compost to be ready? So essentially set it and forget it, um, you know, about a year typically, depending on how large it is, your, your pile and stuff. But if, uh, you know, if you're aerating on a weekly basis and, and sort of letting it do its thing, um, you know, it'll it'll take it still several months to, to decompose, but not as long as if you just let it do it, leave it alone. And then um, it can be ready as in as little as several weeks um, if you if you're pretty diligent and you work pretty hard at it. Um, so the ideal scenario is um, you put everything in at once on the second day, you're going to turn your pile and then on the fourth day and then every three days after that. So that's a very regimented sort of schedule of composting, but that's how you're going to get your compost as, as quickly as, as possible. So again, just real quick to reinstate sort of uh, what we said about what your compost is going to look like. It's going to look like, you know, basically fresh made pot and soil. Um, it's going to be loose and crumbly. It's going to be dark brown to black. It's going to have a nice smell to it. Um, it's, it's not going to be, you're not going to be able to see big pieces of, of, of the parent material or your ingredients that you added um, and your pile is also going to shrink and that's how you're going to know that the compost is ready as well. You can also test your compost a few different ways. So uh, ideally I do the bag test. So you take a handful of your compost um, or what you think is ready compost, put it in a bag um, and seal it for a couple of days. And then, and you know, after those couple of days, you're going to open it and it shouldn't smell bad. It should still smell earthy and, and smell nice. Um, and that's, that lets you know that, that it's going to work, um, work out. So um, how do I build a compost pile? So basically, if you don't want to do a bin, you're going to do a pile. And essentially, you're looking for a three by three size. Um, so, you know, three foot by wide by three foot high. Um, this is really going to help, um, you know, keep everything sort of at a manageable level, manageable size, and it's going to help with the aeration and moisture levels as well. Um, so this is just sort of a, a quick rundown of a, of a quick batch of compost. Um, so you might have four inches of, of you know, branches or, or whatever at the bottom or a little larger pieces at the bottom. Um, this is going to add for aeration, especially from the bottom up. Um, then you're going to do your four to five inches of browns, two to three inches of greens. You're going to alternate levels. So depending on how much product or how many ingredients you have, you're going to keep alternating these levels, browns and greens. You, you can throw in a handful of soil, um, like natural soil, not like potting soil, but like natural soil in your yard. Throw it into your, to your compost pile. What this does is just sort of um, increases and, and, and uh, sort of gets things going quicker as far as microorganisms and stuff like that. Um, but then you're going to top your pile with uh, four, to in, four to five inches um, of those browns again. So lots and lots of, uh, of leaves from the fall work for your compost pile. Um, again, you don't need a bin. You can just make it in piles. Um, but uh, bins are a little nicer, a little cleaner, a little, you know, more appealing looking and that sort of thing. Um, so just, you know, depending on where you are and what space you have and all that kind of stuff um, will determine if you if you want to do a bin or a pile. There's lots of different types of bins, um, you know, and we're going to talk about each one of these. But what we're going to do now is I am going to stop sharing right quick because I have a little video that I'd like to share. Uh, let's see, let's see. All right. So I mentioned the name Rhonda Sherman. She is like the guru of compost and vermicompost. So I want you to hear from her about different compost bins here. Hi, I'm Rhonda Sherman. I'm an extension specialist at NC State University, and this is Homegrown in the Garden. You're at my compost learning lab where I have a variety of compost bins. You can see there are about 14 different types of compost bins here. So composting is very important because 
you can put your yard waste and your food scraps into the compost bin and it will turn it into a valuable product to enhance your soil and plants. First, I'm going to show you a rotating bin. This is uh, very popular. A lot of people like to buy a bin like this, but they're very expensive. A lot of times they'll cost between $200 and $400. And with all these people contacting me from all over the United States, most of the people have told me that they can't get the tumbler bin to work well. Here's another type of bin, and you can see that um, it has aeration, like all of these slats bring in air, and then there's a lot of air um, available for the microorganisms on top here, but it's a little too much. So the only thing I would say about a bin like this is I would want to cover the top of it because otherwise it's going to dry out too much. It's important for your compost, for the material in your compost bin to be 50% moisture level by weight. And what that is like a damp sponge. So now I'm going to show you the most popular bin in the United States. And it works really well. It has some really good features. You can see that there are air holes just in strategic places but it's not all over because the biggest problem with, verm with composting is that people don't let the pile stay moist enough. And so this will help hold in moisture. And you can see it has a locking lid. So moisture is not going to escape through the top of the lid. And it's a nice size for getting at the compost in there. And you take your digging fork and you can just turn your material. So what I do is I collect leaves during the fall and I keep a pile of leaves next to my compost bin and then I um, put a bunch of leaves in my bin and then I bring out my food waste that I keep in the freezer and then I just dump my food waste in there and then I cover it up. So you cover it up with this material and then it doesn't smell it will break down very quickly um, within a few months. To remove the compost, there's a door right here. And so generally you would take a shovel or a digging fork and you would pull the material out of that door. So this site shows a variety of compost bins, but you don't have to have a bin. You could just have a pile where you pile up leaves in your backyard and then you can compost it there. With a bin, it helps to keep the materials tidy and it can keep pests from, from getting into the bin. So this is Rhonda Sherman for Homegrown in the Garden. Thank you and enjoy composting. Be sure to check out my website. Hang on, sorry, I think I, I lost y'all. Hang on just a second. <laughs> there you are. There we are. Okay. All right. Let me try this again. Let's see. Got to find my place in my in our thing here. All right, we'll share one more time, try to, all right. So, um, like Rhonda said, there's lots of different types of bins out there that you can use, um, and it really just depends on what you're doing, how you're doing it, um, and what, what looks good to you. Um, you know, here, uh, like I said, again, ideally you're looking for like a three foot by three foot space. And you can, you know, make that space if you're making a homemade bin, or you can, uh, you know, if you need to make it a little larger, you can do sort of a five by five by five deal. Um, but just know that that's going to be a little more um, difficult to, to manage and to, to move around and stuff. Um, and, and sometimes it can become anaerobic inside the middle if it's so large. Um, 
Here's the garbage can bin. Um, this is, you know, basically self-explanatory. It's a garbage can with holes in it for aeration. It's sort of a set it and forget it sort of deal because um, it's it's harder to get in there and, and get it mixed up really well. But, you know, it is the type that works pretty well. Here's a concrete block pen. So this is a little bit of a larger um, sort of construction and a little more expensive, but it, it works really well. A wooden pallet bin. So, you know, with the prices of uh, lumber right now, if you've got some pallets laying around, you can make you a nice uh, compost bin. Here's a wire mesh bin, again, sort of one of those things. This is sort of one of my preferred um, methods is I like to go ahead and collect all my things and all my ingredients and do it all at one time, throw it in a wire mesh bin, set it and forget it. And then next gardening season, next spring, I can hopefully have a nice little pile of compost to top dress or incorporate into my vegetable garden. Um, so this is just an example of a garden that uses compost. So I was talking earlier about sort of the two different styles or batches that you can do of compost, one being sort of a single batch, but then we've got sort of a continuous batch. And this is where this three compartment um, sort of compost bin or compost pile, um, you know, takes place. So what you have here is generally all the time you have a pile or piece of this bin that is actively decomposing, actively turning into compost. You have one that you are adding, you're layering and you're adding in your materials as you get them. Um, and then another side is for collection of, of items. Um, you know, you can uh, you can use it for, for um, like if you, you know, in the fall, we get all of our leaves typically. So, you know, you can sort of stockpile them in that sort of situation because that's gonna be your base layer from when you move to that bin. So this is just another example of, of uh, a different sort of style of composting. Like again, what Rhonda said, there's tons and tons of different sort of bins for small spaces or larger spaces. These are your enclosed bins that have different functions and features on them. Here's some rotating bins. Again, self-explanatory, you sort of move them around. Uh, spherical bins. So these are pretty cool, especially if you have littles around. So, um, you know, you can get you a spherical bin, add in all your stuff all at once and put it in the backyard and then, you know, make sure the littles can roll it around and play with it and that sort of thing when they're back there. Um, tumblers. So there's lots of different types of tumblers here. Um, some that are sort of uh, uh, over under and then some that sort of turn. Um, I have the bin that uh, Rhonda was talking about in her video that is sort of a, a tumbler like, like that's on the screen here. Um, but like she said, a lot of people don't have good luck with that. I haven't had good luck with that um, style of bin. So, you know, it's always just a personal preference of what you like and what looks nice to you. Um, this is an in-ground food trap uh, or food scrap composting. So you add all your food scraps and then you add some browns and then sort of it's a little small uh, single way of doing some uh, small small groups of compost. Um, so, so, so taking care of your compost pile, uh, again, depending on what sort of style you're doing, the amount of ingredients you have, um, but the most rapid composting is achieved by adding, you know, your mixed browns and greens and layering, layering them at first and then adding, uh, air and, and aerating with your, with, by mixing it in, um, and then uh, controlling your water content. So making sure you stay on top of that, make sure every time you go to it, it's, it feels sort of like a, a rung out sponge. Um, and then when your pile no longer is, uh, is no longer heating after you're mixing, um, you want to let it sort of sit for four weeks or so, and so sort of let it cure. Um, and then you can do those compost tests that we talked about, and then you're just about ready to use your compost. Um, we talked about a screen. So this is just a way that you can, um, you know, make your little screen. This helps get larger items out of your compost and that sort of thing. So again, most important part of compost and what you understand is your browns versus your greens. Um, we're really looking for that perfect um, ratio and, and can anybody tell me, unmute and tell me what that perfect ratio is? Browns to greens? <laughs> so we're looking for that 30 to one or, or, or you know, five parts to, to every single part of greens. Um, but, but usually that's not a problem because we have a lot of 
a lot more browns anyways than we do greens. But just keep in mind those ratios and making sure that you're layering and making sure that you're not having too many greens um, and, and nitrogen sources in your compost pile. Um, again, this is just sort of a, of a breakdown of, of what the browns do versus what greens do and that sort of thing. But we'll make sure that this uh, recording will be available on YouTube so you can check that out. So again, the slide set was made from uh, Rhonda Sherman, who is wonderful with our compost. So now I'm going to, let's see, I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to open it up for any quick questions before we move into vermicomposting. Do we have any questions for regular composting right this second? I also added in our, uh, or the link to the composting website for NC State University that has all of the videos and more information and handouts and things on composting as well as vermicomposting. So that is that. All right, I'm not seeing any questions. So I'm going to jump into our vermicomposting. Um, There's a question someone wants to know the best time of year to start a compost pile. Yeah, so that's a great question. And it, of course, the answer is it depends. Um, what kind of compost are you gonna do? Are you gonna do a set it and forget it sort of style compost? In that fact, I would probably do it the year before I need it. Um, so, you know, during this gardening season, it might be a great time to sort of start a set it and forget it sort of uh, type of compost. That way next year, it can be ready for when you do your next garden. Um, it, and it really also depends on what you're growing and, and when you're growing it. So if you are a, um, if you really like to do cool season vegetables um, and you'll be doing that later this year and, and you have some time to devote to the process and, you know, you can be um, diligent about turning and things like that, then you might start some now. And if you, if you keep working on it and working at it, um, you might have some available for when you do those uh, cool season vegetables later on in the year. But yeah, it's all, it all depends on what you want to do and when you want to do it um, as to the best time of year to start. Um, of course, in autumn, it's a great time to start stockpiling that, uh, all of those browns that we get from the, from the deciduous trees that when they drop all their leaves. Um, but that's a good question. That's a good question. All right, so Chris, you just watched the chat now and I'm gonna start sharing the other one now. I'm keeping my eyes peeled. All right, so now we're gonna talk a little bit about vermicomposting. Um, and this slide set was adapted from, again, Rhonda Sherman's um, document entitled, Worms Can Recycle Your Garbage. So when we are talking about vermicomposting, we are talking about composting with worms or specifically red worms. Now I have my compost or my vermicompost bin right here in my office. And if you're ever in the office and you want to check it out, please come see me and I'll be glad to talk worms with you. Um, but basically the composting with worms is, is, is called vermicomposting. And what it does is it helps divert, uh, you know, waste, extra excess waste from the landfill. It literally takes no space at all. Cause like I said, this is my entire worm bin right here in my office. And you can ask anybody in the office, you never smell it, you never, anything. Um, so so it's, it's an excellent small composting uh, method that you can do year round. So you can do this literally all year long. Um, as long as you have the food scraps to feed your worms, you are, you are good to go. Um, and then it's an excellent uh, uh, soil amendment. So because it's a little bit of a smaller thing, a little bit smaller process, um, I'm a bit of a house plant sort of person. Um, so I love to use vermicompost on my houseplants every time I go to fertilize my houseplants. Um, so, so this is a great small um, way of composting right inside your house. Um, so obviously since these are indoors, we are using bins for this. There are totally and lots of different ways to use your com or to, to make compost bins. Um, you can you can purchase them. So they've got lots of cool different ones that that are made for purchase um, or you can make a simple plastic one like I did. And we'll see that here in a few minutes. Um, but it, it's also depending on what kind of bin you use will, will uh, be decided 
by how much food waste you have. Um, so if you have lots of food waste and you have lots to feed your, your uh, worms, then you can have a larger worm bin. Um, but if you're like me and you don't eat as many fruits and vegetables as you should, um, you can stick with the little smaller um, worm bin. But generally speaking, the rule of thumb is one square foot of sur surface area for uh, each pound of food waste generated. <clears throat> so here's some examples. Of, our, of different kind of worm bins. So you've got, um, you know, a worm bin like I've got is the, is the general um, Rubbermaid bin. You've got the little black one there that's sort of layered. We also have one of those here at the office that you can check and sh check out and see. Um, and then you've got sort of a strainer sort of deal there on the bottom. But essentially, um, you're, you're, when you're prepping your worm bin, you're gonna rinse out the bin, whatever kind it is, whether it's one you made, um, or one that you bought just to make sure there's no residues or chemicals in it. Um, you're gonna, if you're making it, you're gonna drill holes in the upper sides for circulation. So, I don't know if you can see that, but there are circulation holes drilled there at the top. Um, and I always get this question, but aren't my worms gonna escape? No, if you provide the correct habitat for them inside of your bin, they're not gonna escape. Plus they're really sensitive to light, so they're not gonna be trying to come out um, of it because of the light. <laughs> You're also gonna drill holes in the bottom of your bin. And this is to make sure that there's some drainage space in case there is, it gets you know, too damp or too wet in there for whatever reason. Again, you can place inside or outside. If you're gonna do it outside, you wanna make sure that it's in a nice shaded cool space because you don't want to fry your worms inside of their bin. You also need to make sure that they have plenty of air circulation around the bin. So don't stack things on top and put things all around it um, because then it can become a bad situation. Again, these, this process needs a, a, a aerobic sort of uh, environment, not an anaerobic because then things start to die, decay in a negative light um, and then they start to stink. Um, so again, never place it in direct sun if you put them outside. For worm bedding, there's a lot of different options. Here in the office, we have lots and lots of uh, paper shreds. So that's generally what we use here. Uh, paper shreds and newspaper um, is, is what we use for bedding. The great thing about this is it also serves as food. So again, if you're like me and you don't necessarily eat as many fruits and vegetables as you should, um, your worms generally always have something to eat because their bedding is also their food. Um, but you also want to make sure that it's not toxic. So you, you want to make sure it doesn't have a lot of dyes in it or a lot of, you know, ink sort of things in it. You want to make sure it's not that sort of uh, glossy. Like I, I think of like the Target and Belk ads inside the newspaper. You don't want to use those sorts of uh, paper products for bedding. Um, and then magazines, too, of course, have all the color and, and stuff in them as well. Um, and then of course you wanna make sure that it allows air to circulate um, inside of the bedding and it doesn't get too compressed. Again, just some more on the uh, worm bedding. You wanna make sure you tear it or shred it a little bit. You don't wanna put big old pieces of, of uh, bedding in there because it'll, um, you know, it can make it anaerobic and, and make it start to stink. Uh, you can soak the material in uh, a bucket for a little bit of time. You can spray it down, but you just want to make sure that you put it in moist and not dry. Uh, you also want to make sure it's not excessively wet. Um, so again, this is why your drainage holes are in the bottom, but you want to make sure that you wring it out real good. Um, and basically, again, it's going to feel like a damp sponge when you, uh, when you put it inside your worm bin. And if you want to, it's not required, but if you want to, you can add a handful of natural soil, again, not potting soil, but natural soil inside of your bin, just to give it a little more of a uh, jump start onto the decomposition process. And so when we're talking about vermicomposting, this means that we're talking about a very specific type of worm. And so in Acidia fetida is the uh, scientific name of the red wiggler. These are the worms that we're using for composting. We're not using earthworms outside. We're not using night crawlers. We're not using, you know, worms that we go and buy from the, the uh, bait and tackle place. We're using red wigglers specifically um, for our vermicompost. And I can give you a resource to where you can order these worms at. Um, but essentially you want the red worms. If you're starting with a bin like mine, the very small Rubbermaid, 
you're just gonna want one pound of worms. Um, and so that will sort of get you started and then they'll obviously reproduce as they get happier. And then you can actually, you know, break them up and, and share them, but we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Um, so just adding your worms to your bin, you're gonna place the worms on top of the bedding and then they're gonna crawl down away from the light. Um, so you don't have to like bury them or, or plant them. You know, you just put, put them right on top in your, of your worm bin and they'll crawl and do all their, you know, wormy things and that sort of stuff. Um, however, if worms try to escape, so if you see a lot of them trying to, you know, sort of go up the sides of your bin or something like that, um, place it in a bright area because again, they're really sensitive to light. So they will try to bury themselves and get away from that light as best as they can. Um, and then before you feed them, you want to let them sort of acclimate into their new environment for a few days. So, you know, give them two or three days before you start adding in a bunch of food um, to their worm bin. So after they, after your worms have settled, you can add, start adding that food scraps to their bedding surface. Ideally, you want to make sure that um, you cover their their uh, their food source with bedding um, to prevent flies and that sort of thing, and to encourage them to eat it. Um, you can also store food scraps in the fridge or freezer before uh, feeding worms. Here at the office, we generally have a bag of frozen, um, you know, food leftovers from our FCS agent Eleanor, um, and th that serves as great food source for our uh, worms here in the office. Also, don't want to make you want to make sure that you don't add more food um, until the worms have eaten the previous scraps. So this will be a little bit of a learning curve for you, um, just depending on how active your worms are and how well they are um, at, at feeding inside of your worm bin. So just like our compost bin, there are also things we want to make sure that we don't feed our worms or we don't put in our worm bin because they won't eat it. Um, this includes all meats, greasy, oily foods onions, garlic, um, tobacco, any fats or salty, um, no pet waste or no, no, you know, excrement of any kind, um, and then no citrus. Um, so no orange rinds or anything like that, um, because what will happen is it's it, obviously it's too acidic for our worms, so they won't touch it, and it'll just rot inside of your worm bins and then, you know, cause lots of problems. However, there are lots of things you can add to feed your worms, and that's lots of different vegetables and fruits, um, peelings, or even little chunks. Again, with our compost, we wanna make sure that we're making small pieces. That's what you wanna do for your worms as well. You wanna make sure that those pieces are cut up really finely because it won't take as long for it to break down. Crushed eggshells do really well. Um, coffee grounds and tea bags do really well inside of there. Again, you might wanna break it up a little bit. Um, and then just some general shredded garden debris, again, very small pieces, but you can also add that into your, um, into your own brand as well. We have found, so Eleanor and I are, are, have, have found that um, pumpkin cantaloupe and watermelon um, are, are excellent choices for your, uh, for your worm bin. Um, so again, don't overfeed. You want to make sure that you are sort of feeding them as, as they go. You wanna make sure that you don't, you're not putting too much food in there because again, it's gonna to start to rot. It's gonna to start to decay in a negative light and you don't want any of that. Um, and as hard as it's gonna be, once your worms get established, you don't want to stir the content. So what's happening is there's sort of layers inside of natural layers that your worms are gonna create inside of their being. And those are what they need in order to survive. So you don't want to get in there and stir it all up and mix it all up all the time because they'll constantly be working to create that environment that they need and not breaking down the food and stuff like, like you're wanting them to do. Um, long term, so over time, um, you know, you're going to see other things start to appear and that's okay um, as long as they're not flies. If they're flies, um, then, then that's not a good thing and we've got to figure out what's going on. Have you got too much food? Is it too wet? That sort of thing. Um, and then uh, after a few months, your bedding is also going to start to slowly, de uh, you know, go away. So you want to make sure that you add more um, every few months or so. And then if you are going on vacation, um, if you want to consider your worms a pet, this is a great pet to have when you go on lots of vacations because you can feed them ahead of time and they're good. And then, like I said, if you're using a natural uh, paper product for their bedding, they're not going to go hungry. So you're good to go with that. And then um, sort of 
one of the last things that you're going to think about, um, and the whole reason why you're doing this, is you're going to harvest that vermicompost. Um, so there are three different ways that you can do that. You can do, it's all about separation. So what you're doing is you're separating the worms from the uh, vermicompost or the excrement of those worms. Um, so you can do that sideways by light or by vertical, just depending on, you know, sort of what you what what space you have and, and and what kind of time you have in order to accomplish this but again all of these are going to be on our uh, are going to be on youtube and we can send you this slide set as well um so you have more resources and speaking of resources here are all the resources again from um nc state university and uh you know you can go on there and they've got more than you've ever thought about wanting to know about worms and compost and vermicompost. So with that, I am finished presenting um, and I would like to open it up for any questions that y'all have. <laughs> Vermicomposting is super fun and super easy. And again, like I said, if you ever are in the office here, I'd be glad to show you um, our worm bins here and you can sort of see how easy it really is. Well, that was great, Taylor. Um, yeah. I can't turn my video back on, so it's just as well. Um, it was it was a, a really informative program and I just, I've been planning how I'm going to start vermicomposting bins with my, with my grandkids, so. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, yes. We've done a 4-H program with vermicomposting, and it's yeah. always super popular. Yeah. Lots of fun. Lots of fun. So thank you so much. Yeah. So, okay, we got a question here in the uh, chat. Um, estimated okay. investment, worms, bins, etc. So depending again on how large of a scale you want to do this, um, I think my bin um, was from Walmart for like five bucks. And then I think the one pound of worms that I started with was maybe $20, maybe a little less. I can't quite remember because it's been a little while. Um, but generally, you know, 20 to 30 bucks and you can have you a, you know, a, a home worm bin. Um, All right. All right. Okay. Thank you so much again, Taylor. Yeah. Uh, thank you, everybody. This will be up on YouTube ASAP. So thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you.